I provided you with, I'm going to provide you with a lot of slides to show you what this GLC world looks like. But before I get into that, let me make a few opening remarks. Let me start with the political system. Today, we are confronted with a crisis of, uh, un of an unprecedented nature. In 2018, we welcomed the rise of what we call New Malaysia. Finally, the single dominant party, Barisan National, or more precisely, UMNO, had been thrown out from power. The opposition had come to occupy government. And we were expecting enormous changes to occur because they had given us a manifesto that promised enormous reforms. Now, I want to say this before I move on. When you have a country which has been long under authoritarian rule, when they suddenly shift to democracy and the process of democratization begins, that shift is always characterized by a lot of chaos. We have seen this in history. If you look at Latin America, when we saw the transition from authoritarian rule to democracy, it was characterized by a lot of problems as they began that move to consolidate democracy. More at home in Southeast Asia, if you look at Philippines or Indonesia, Philippines in 1986, Indonesia in 1997, 1998, when democracy came to these countries, it took them a long time to consolidate democracy. And in that period between that transition from authoritarian rule to democracy, during that early periods, you would have noticed if you look at their history, a lot of chaos. I'm giving you all this introduction to let you all know, even though we are probably quite depressed by what we are seeing today in Malaysia, we shouldn't be too surprised. We have seen this before in history, in Southeast Asian history, in Latin American history. But let me move on to the issue that we really need to discuss today, reforms. Reforms are something that we were talking about even before the change of government occurred. Even before the change, uh, under, under the Barisan National, we were having debates about the Malaysian economy being caught in the high middle income trap. We were talking about an education system that was not providing our students with the right kind of teaching, learning, to equip them with the skills to move into this modern, rapidly changing economy. We were talking about the need also whether we should have race-based policies. There was a big debate about this. In 2008, after the global financial crisis, a big debate started about a new economic model. And one of the things that Najib said at the time was, no more affirmative action, no more race-based policies. He quickly changed. He quickly changed the agenda and brought back uh, race-based policies. He introduced in 2013, the Bumiputra Economic Empowerment Policy. So you can see the backtrackings going on. Reforms were already being called for even before this transition to democracy occurred. Meanwhile, once the transition occurred, we, what we also saw was the problem with coalitions. A new coalition, Pakistan, was formed to bring down the Barisan National. And unexpectedly, they won. But this new coalition was also led by old, old elites. Who are these old elites in this new Malaysia, Mahate, Muhammad, times I know the Mohidin Yesai. So we had a new government, supposedly a new Malaysia, but led by all elites. And many of these all elites had contributed to the problems that we are seeing in the country today. And subsequently, as you saw, with this transition, we had the problem of not just politicians hopping, we also began to see parties hopping from one coalition to the other. All this significantly, significantly hampered the reforms that Malaysia so badly needed. And this is 2018, before even the pandemic occurred. Now, at the center of all this is the system that we're going to talk about today, the GLC sector. I am actually surprised that many people know so little about this term, the GLCs, because the link between government and business is something that goes back to 1970. In 1970, they introduced a new economic model. When the new economic model, the new economic policy, sorry, the NEP, when the new economic policy was brought into play, it meant enormous government intervention in the economy. And when the government decided to intervene in the economy, they created what was known as public enterprises. 
the names of these public enterprises were later converted to government linked companies. Now, how we employ uh, development, how we employ GLCs in development depends on who is the prime minister. Under Razak, to Razak took over, he stressed using public enterprises to implement the NEP. When Mahathir took over, there was a shift. For Mahathir, he began to move away from his focus, his focus on using public enterprises to develop the economy, to focus on creating big businesses, conglomerates. He wanted to create a new Malay business class. He wanted to create corporate captains, Bumiputra corporate captains. So there was much focus under Mahate on concepts such as policy, such as privatization. And so you'll see here, if public enterprises acquired a lot of companies and became a major player in the economy, Mahate then began the process of privatization ostensibly to reduce the role of government in this business. You saw the documentary just now, same debates were going on in Malaysia in the 1980s, reduce the presence of the government economy by privatization. But this led to a serious problem of crony capitalism. Major conglomerates that emerged in Malaysia were all well connected. And one of the key factors that characterized Mahathir's administration was the rise of money politics and cor corruption. And that eventually contributed to the 1997 crisis and subsequently the reformacy in Malaysia. Mahathir left not long after the 1999 uh, election, recognizing that there was a backlash against him and his economic model. Then comes Abdullah. Abdullah's focus was not on big business. Abdullah's focus was on strengthening the small and medium scale enterprises. And if you look at his policies, and some of his policies were quite good. The Night Malaysia Plan was one of the best Malaysia plans I've read so far. And the focus was on helping small enterprises. Why was this important? 98% of the corporate sector in Malaysia constitute SMEs. Abdullah was on the right track, but Abdullah didn't really push that agenda properly in terms of creating, helping these SMEs. And then we had the global financial crisis in 2008. This partly contributed also to Abdullah's fall. Abdullah also fell because he didn't deliver on his policies, including, including creating a more inclusive Malaysia as well as eradicating corruption. In fact, corruption continued to fester under Abdullah. When Najib came in post-2008 global financial crisis, he promised us a new economic model. He said that he will stop uh, this idea of corrupt, this extensive corruption, patronage, and cronyism. He said those words, uh, I'm going to stop these three things. He also said that he was going to introduce privatization. He said, no more race-based policies, no more affirmative action. Soon after saying all this, there was a backlash from UMNO, and he backtracked on all these things. Privatization was put uh, in the closet, and he introduced his, uh, his own economic model, which uh, he said, I'm, I'm going to keep affirmative action, but I'm going to call it market-friendly affirmative action. If you look at the 10th Malaysia plan, that's the key concept, market-friendly affirmative action. Nobody believed it. In fact, investments didn't really grow, even uh, domestic investments didn't really grow under Najib. And then we saw the fall of Najib. I should say in two, 2000, between 2009 and 2013, Najib introduced a number of public policies, the new economic model, the uh, economic transformation plan, the economic, uh, the uh, NKRIs, a whole slew of them. But his policies didn't seem to have an impact on the Malaysian economy. And in 2013, we saw the consequence of that. His government, again, lost very badly in 2013. And what did he do? There's the infamous, the infamous title headlines in Utusan, Apalagi China Ma. He racialized the discussion. And then, post-2013, he introduced his own affirmative action policy called the Bumiputra Economic Empowerment Policy. And then he said, I am going to use the GLCs to implement the BEE, the Bumiputra Economic Empowerment Policy. GLCs were back into the main frame. Consequence of bringing GLCs back into the main frame are these. First, we saw the 1MDB scandal, a scandal of a company which was supposed to be a sovereign wealth fund, but actually used to further enrich politicians, specifically Najib himself. 
Then we had other major scandals. We had the Mara scandal. We had the Tabung Haji scandal. We had the Felda scandal. And the list goes on. A consequence of all this was promising change using the GLCs, promising a Bumiputra economic empowerment policy to empower Bumiputras, but actually the policy was abused to empower or enrich politicians themselves. Poor Malays remained, poor Bumiputras remained poor. It is interesting if you look back from 1970 to 2018, a period of 44 years, if you look at that period, when they introduced affirmative action to target Bumiputras, specifically poor Bumiputras, that was the aim of the NEP, lift the poor out of poverty, specifically rural poor Bumiputras. Why is it after nearly 50 years, the poorest people in Malaysia today continue to, to be primarily poor rural-based Bumiputras? The poorest states in this country today include Sabah, Klantan, Kedah, Tranganu, these are all Bumiputra dominant states. This goes to show how the rhetoric of race has been exploited by politicians in power, not to really bring about social reforms or to bring about equity between ethnic communities, but to further empower themselves. So 2018 was a monumental election. If you look at the 2018 election, what is very clear is this. They promised us enormous reforms. If you look at that manifesto, it was one of the thickest manifesto you will ever see printed by a political party going into an election. It was a very fine manifesto. But soon after coming to power, one of the main things that was said was, they said, from now on, we will have needs-based policies. We will not have race-based policies. But soon after coming to power, they changed and they introduced the shared prosperity vision, which was, again, a race-based or race-dominant type policy. So you can see here politicians refusing to move away from public policies that are ethnically defined. And their tool for implementing it are the GLCs. But what are these GLCs? These GLCs are what I now call the shadow world a world in which you see a lot of rent-seeking, patronage, and corruption. I already mentioned some of these companies just now. That is why in 2018, in the run-up to the general election, Mahate, when he took on Najib, he knew about the shadow world, and he called the shadow world, the GLCs, a monster. Those are his words, not mine, a monster. Why did Mahate use the words a monster when describing the GLCs? He should know. He created this world. He knew how Najib and the government was abusing the shadow world to further enrich themselves. And he promised change. But when he came to power, Mahate did not do anything to reform this GLC world. And I'll show you more about this later. Why? He didn't do it because the GLC world remains a mechanism through which they can garner a lot of support. Again, I'll show you this as I get into the talk. I want to move forward to 2020. The disappointment of Pakatan was, some will argue they didn't have enough time to do it because they were unexpectedly overthrown through a coup, the Sheraton coup, fine. But in 2020, we also had the COVID pandemic. We not only had a political crisis, we were also confronted with a health crisis. When the health crisis occurred, the government had to announce a lockdown. All of us had to go home and stay home, and that includes companies. Private enterprises were all asked to shut. Who then could save the economy when all private firms were asked to stay home? And that's when the then finance, the, the new finance minister, Tunku Zafro, mentioned the term a government ecosystem. And people were wondering, what is this government ecosystem? And then he said, it's the GLCs. I'm going to use the GLCs. We've got a GLC world, which we can employ to save the Malaysian economy. And if you go back to early last year, around March last year, you will remember what happened. The, the banks put a monetarium on loans. These were GLC banks, Maybank, CIMB, RHB. In uh, the utilities, Tanaga reduced the rates for power supply. That was a boon for everyone staying at home a reduction in power rates. 
in telecommunications, there was talk about uh, uh, further improving tele telecommunications and also reducing the cost for it. Why? Because the government was involved in all these sectors. And you will remember when uh, the Mohidin government took over in the initial period, we were rather surprised. The initial outcomes were good. The number of COVID pandemic cases, uh, COVID cases reduced. What really triggered the rise was the sudden decision to have the Sabah state election. Again, another political swing, uh, another political, uh, uh, unnecessary political problem that was created, which contributed then to the escalation in the problem. But let me come back to the government ecosystem. The government ecosystem, which uh, the government promised to use effectively to deal with the crisis, which they did initially, subsequently came under siege by politicians because when uh, Ikatan took power, when Mohidin took power, he not only created one of the largest cabinets to ensure the people who had hopped over to his coalition would remain with him to further consolidate support and to further uh, allow those people who hopped over to stay with him. He infamously announced, and you remember this, he was going to give the GLC appointments to those who joined his coalition. And a whole slew of politicians who hopped over were made directors of DLCs and given additional income apart from the parliamentary stipend and uh, whatever other income they were getting as uh, parliamentarians. While they viewed the government ecosystem and DLCs were important to save the economy and even showed it, but when politics came into play, the pursuit of power, the need to consolidate power, power they abused the system as it had been abused before the fall of the Barisan National in 2018. And let's come forward to last month. Just last month, before the fall of the Pikatan government, Finance Minister Tunku Zaful said, look, the economy is in bad shape. I have to go back and use the government ecosystem. And I'm introducing what he called the Pakuko plan. The Pakuko plan to strengthen, he was saying, I'm going to strengthen the GLCs, specifically the GLICs, to help them really intervene in the economy better because the economy is in bad shape. The volume of companies that are now in dire straits is quite high. He also announced the introduction of the digital economy blueprint. The rapid uh, use of technology in the economy post pandemic meant that we really needed to digitize companies. We needed to bring uh, e-learning and e-teaching into the schools, into the universities. The need for a digital economy became a brief rundown in history. So you understand the history of the, and I'm contextualizing here, the GLCs. But there are two questions I want to take with you before, for you to consider as I take you now into uh, my lecture on the GLCs, my lecture proper on the GLCs. First, what is this nature of the ties between government and business, particularly during this dual crisis? The second, we all recognize now from this brief history that I've accounted or recounted to you, that there is a need to use these GLCs effectively, especially when companies are in dire straits. But has there been an attempt to dismantle this patronage base rent seeking type GLC system, the shadow world, to bring it out into the light. Why have they not done it? What is actually going on? So let me now introduce you to the GLC world, the shadow world. Here, what I'm showing you is what is known as the GLICs, the government linked investment companies. These are the major enterprises in the GLC world. These are enterprises that all of you should know about. You know Kazana, the Sovereign Wealth Fund. Everyone knows the Employees Provident Fund. Uh, PNB, the Bondala National Bahat. KWAP is the pension fund for civil servants. Tabong Haji, you all know Tabong Haji very well. And then you have also other institutions like uh, the Lamaga uh, LTAT, which is LTAT is the pension fund for those in the armed forces. Now, these seven institutions, including Minister of Finance Incorporated, these seven institutions own a huge range of companies. Employees Provident Fund, Kazana, and PNB are among the largest owners of publicly listed companies in this country. Tabung Haji is a business group in its own right, along with LTAT. 
which owns Boston, major business groups. KWAP also owns a lot of publicly listed companies. These are major enterprises. But do you know that there is another issue about the GLC world that I should that you should know about? Ministries, that ministries are in business. And if you look at the ministries in business, I'm here showing you the figures for 2017. All this data I'm taking from my book, Minister of Finance Incorporated, which if you want to know more of, please read the book. But in this book, what we drew attention to was what we called the big four. I'm not talking about the present day ministry. I'm talking about, as you can see here, 2017 before the fall. The big four were the prime minister's department, the minister of finance, the ministry of finance, surprisingly, ministry of rural and regional development, and even more surprisingly, ministry of science and technology. These four had a huge number of GLCs. Now, just these four, let me show you the world, the GLC world, the shadow world of just these four ministries. Here you are. As you can see, Minister of Finance and more F, Prime Minister's Department, PMD, Ministry of Rural Development, more state. And what, what does this diagram show you? First, we have the ministries, which I've just highlighted. Then we have the GLICs, KWAP, Kabung Haji in pink, which I just highlighted earlier, Kazana National. These are all major enterprises which own a lot of companies, as you can see here. There are also statutory bodies. Statutory bodies are important institutions like MARA, and FELDA, which are regulated by law. They are different from G, from companies which are regulated by the Companies Act. The Universal Companies Act is very different from a statutory body which has its own act. So these, just these four, just look at the number of companies the big four control. And that is why it is always important to know who are the ministers of the big four. Under Najib, the big four, Prime Minister, Department and Ministry of Finance, the two largest ones, were always controlled by the Prime Minister himself. Who started this trend of Prime Minister serving as Finance Minister? Finance Minister is an important portfolio, as you saw just now. Mahate himself. Mahate himself started this trend of a Prime Minister being Finance Minister. Under the manifesto and Pakatan, they said, no more will we allow the Finance Minister to be the Prime Minister too. There must be a delinking between the exchequer and the prime minister. And that happened. That happened. For Ministry of Rural Development, here you are. The Minister of Rural Development under Najib was none other than his mentee, Ismail Sabri Yaakob, current prime minister of Malaysia. Ismail Sabri was very closely aligned with Najib. Before, before Ismail Sabri was the Minister for Rural Development, the minister was Shafi Abdal. Shafi Abdal was also very closely aligned with Najib Razak. Shafi Abdal was Deputy Minister of Defense with Najib Razak. As you can see here, the person who holds the role of Minister of Rural Development is always someone very close to the Prime Minister. Why? Because the Ministry of Rural Development has its tentacles deep into the Malay heartland states. Whoever controls the Ministry of Rural Development has got tentacles or through the GLC world that reaches right into the UMNO heartland areas. And that's why this ministry is so important. This ministry, let me remind you, was created by Tun Razak. Why? Why did Razak create a Ministry of Rural Development? Because his focus was on eradicating poverty in rural areas. That was his focus. So he created a network of public enterprises that got embedded in rural areas, which was also UMNO's stronghold. And whoever controlled these networks into this UMNO stronghold was a, had to be a very powerful politician. Always a senior politician closely linked to the prime minister. For Mosti, and this is important, Mosti, as I told you, is another important ministry. Why? Because in the run-up to 2018, by that time already, we were talking about how we are moving into the digital age into the information age. What had become important was the need for tech, technological development, innovation. These were buzzwords at that time. The multimedia super highway corridor was created. The multimedia university was created to prepare Malaysia for that world. But nobody in UMNO was really interested in Mosti. There's no rents to be created and distributed from Mosti, from this ministry. So who held the portfolio? It was usually, and I'm putting this in with the commas, 
not too important, unimportant minister. And here you can see the minister was uh, Wilfred Tangao, who was at that time acting, acting president of APCO. What happened after Pakatan took power? Mahathir knew this world, let me remind you. Mahathir knew of this world. And when he took over this world, since the prime minister cannot be the finance minister, what did Mahathir do? He took over a major, he took out a major portion of Ministry of Finance and created a new minister called Minister of Economic Affairs and put his close ally, Azmin Ali, in charge of Ministry of Economic Affairs. He made the Ministry of Finance a ministry which was not very, not as powerful as before. And who did he put there? Lem Guaning from the DAP. It looked like a good thing, but if you know the restructuring that happened in the ministries and how they transferred important GLCs into a new ministry, Ministry of Economic Affairs, to a man aligned to Mahathir at the time, Azmin Ali, who was at the time in contestation with Anwar Ibrahim. As you can see here now, how the GLC world is being used by politicians to serve their vested interests. The power play. Instead of using the GLCs and reforming the GLCs as we were promised under the manifesto, Mahathir then used the GLC world to try and consolidate the power base for politicians who were anti anwar This is my interpretation, of course. You're welcome to debate with me on this point. But I can show you the diagrams to show you how the redistribution of GLCs occurred, including the creation of a new ministry. And what happened to Ministry of Rural Development? Who took control of Ministry of Rural Development? Reina Haru of Mahathir's party, Basat, a very important ministry given to a very junior minister, Reina Harun, but she was from Basatu. So you can see here the importance of rural development. And who took charge of Mosti? Yobi In from the DAP. So it looked like DAP were given important, DAP MPs were given important portfolios, but really it was not true. In fact, he merged, Mahathir merged ministry mostly with environment. It was shocking he did that because environment deserved its own focus given environmental problems worldwide, including climate change. And mostly, which was focusing on technology, also required a lot of attention in its own right. But so much for thinking about the big picture, instead, what was more important was the politics of consolidating power. Now you have seen how they use the GLC world. So let's, let me now show you. Let me now show you some of these ministries. Let's start with Prime Minister's Department. Here is a breakdown of the Prime Minister's Department. And I'm showing you the, the breakdown of the big four, just to give you a better picture of what this GLC world looks like. So here's just the Prime Minister's Department. Uh, this is under, not under Mahathir. This is under, this is under Najib. But before I get to that, let me go back to this. What happened when Mohidin took over? When Mohidin took over with Paikatan, Tunku Zafro, apparently closely aligned with Mohidin, apparently closely aligned with Mohidin. Tunku Zafro has objected to this statement that he's aligned with Mohidin, but that's why I said apparently, reportedly. Uh, he took charge of Ministry of Finance. Remember this, Tunku Zafro is not an elected politician, but he was given the important portfolio of Ministry of Finance. Meanwhile, rural development was given to Ahmad Latif. Who is Ahmad Latif? MP from Mersing and from Basatu, Mohidin's party. And Mosti, who did he, who took charge of Mosti under Mohidin? Kairi Jamaluddin from Amna. That goes you to that goes to show how important Kairi was in the new Paikatan government. He was given Mosti. But credit to Kairi that he did quite a bit of good things in Mosti and in fact established himself quite well as minister of Mosti. What happened more recently when we had the change of government just last month? When we had the change of government, uh, the finance minister remains, Tunku Zafu. Rural development today is under Mahade Khalid. Who is Mahade Khalid? He's an Amno Strong, former MP of Kedah, former minister. Mahade Khalid is from Amno, Ismail Sabri's party. Amno has taken control of the major, major ministries. And who is Mosti's minister today? Interestingly enough, also from Amno, Adham Baba, former minister of health, 
who failed miserably in that portfolio transferred to Mosti. Considering that we have a digital economy, digital blueprint prepared, put Adam Barber in charge of Mosti is a great disservice to the nation. So I wanted to show you all now the big four, how it works and why this is why this big four, you should pay attention to it. But let's come back to where I was just now. This shows you, <clears throat> this shows you the prime minister's department. Look at the prime minister's department. Now I'm going to break it down to show you the prime minister's department. Look at this here. The interesting thing about the GLC world is that involved in everything, social, religious, economic. So under social, we have Shalda, very important, Equidas, uh, another, it's a, a sort of investment fund. And then we have uh, religious, religious, we have Tapum Haji, we have the Majlis Agama Islam, Islam, and then we have the economic. The economic one is also very important, important institutions like Petronas and the, uh, Iskanda, the Iskanda Regional Development Authority down south. But look at the table below also. These very important institutions who are, who are the politicians serving as chairman? Very important political figures. So here you can see we control under Najib control the important GLCs, and then put senior politicians in charge of these GLCs. And as you know, there was enormous was an enormous scandal involving uh, Felder and Isa, Isa Sama, a close ally of Najib Brazil. Mm -hmm. Tabung Haji under Abdul Aziz, there was also serious allegations of corruption involving Abdul Aziz involved with regards to Tabung Haji. Court cases are going on in these cases. So here you can see how uh, the GLC world was abused by politicians by putting fellow politicians in these powerful institutions. This is Minister of Finance. You can see here a really very important, huge portfolio. I don't know what the current structure looks like because we couldn't track what happened after Mohidin took over and now we have another government. But this is what it looked like before uh, under Najib. Uh, Mahate restructured it, but I'll just focus on Najib so we, we don't get confused. Uh, let's look at the institutions under Ministry of Finance. Look at the things that the Ministry of Finance does. They are involved in economic matters. We have banks in Panama National, and then we have the other DFIs. What are DFIs? Development Financial Institutions. What are they? SME Bank, Bank Pamanguna, Agro Bank, Export Import Bank. These are very important institutions controlled by Minister of Finance. Then we have social, EPF and KWAP. These are major investment funds too, savings institutions. And then we have the regional development, the Langkawi, uh, development authority and then we have regulatory institutions we even have regulatory institutions controlled by the minister of finance bank negara the Bursa malaysia so you can see here that important institutions under minister of finance which covers a whole range of issues including i should mention investment and look again who controlled the major institutions under the minister of finance none other than the prime minister himself Najib wanted to control Kazana himself. He wanted to control Ministry of Finance Incorporated and other GLIC because they controlled a lot of companies. 1MDB was linked to Minister of Finance Incorporated. So by controlling the Ministry of Finance and key institutions, he could also channel the way in which important the way in funds were channeled to institutions linked to him. Now let's look at Ministry of Rural and Regional Development. Now let me show you why this is so important. Here you can see it's a huge ministry and it controls important institutions like Mara. Very important. Whoever controls Mara controls a huge education and business world. Mara is really huge in that sense. Then we have Rista, Kasada, Katana, what are they? Let me bring you down here to this. Rista is the rubber industry smallholders. Okay, important institution. Then we have Kajora, but, uh, this is a uh, statutory body embedded in southern Jopo, and then we have Kedah, which is situated in the state of Kedah, and then we have Kasada, which is situated in Klantan. So you can see here, Katanga is situated in Trungano. You can see here, again, these institutions, what do they do? Look at that, land development, regional development, land redistribution, education, entrepreneurship. This is a very important portfolio. And as I said, whoever controls this portfolio controls or has links really into rural areas, which is where given the malapportionment that we see in this country, 
the gerrymandering and the malapportionment, those who control the rural areas will have it easier in terms of mobilizing support to win uh, control of government. And look at the people who, look at the list of chairmen of these important institutions. And you can see here very clearly that they are all linked to UMNO. Note also that most of the politicians are from the peninsula. All the politicians I've mentioned so far are from, except for the you are Bang Mokta from Sabah. That shows you the importance of Sarawakian politicians also in this DLC framework that I'm showing you. Not very important as you can see, but this, as far as only the big four is concerned. What happened after Mohidin took over? Mohidin did exactly this. For those who I cannot give cabinet appointments, I will give you all GLC appointments. There you are. This is all he did was change the key players. And then we come to the next one, Mosti. Now, Mosti, you will see, is really not very big, actually. And it does constitute G, GLCs, government linked companies, that were created. And let me show you what they were asked to do financing industries, research and development, technological development, innovation, cybersecurity. These are all companies which were created to drive technological development in this country. As I said, the volume of rents involved here is not very significant and no politicians were not really interested in this ministry. As you can see here, there was only one from our research, we could find only one uh, politician who was in charge of the technology part of Malaysia. Otherwise, there were politicians who were just not interested in this GLC, in this particular ministry which is why it has always been given to politicians who are, not, uh, who are not seen as very important to the prime minister. Now here, I've shown you very quickly the GLC world for ministries and the GLICs, but there's something else I wanna get into very quickly just to show you the world so that you understand this better. This is not limited only to federal government. Every state government has a similar GLC system. That's what's also important that you should know about. If every state has a GLC system, what does this mean? Let me show you some. Here, Selengo under PKR. This is the GLC world in Selengo state government. At the center of it is, you can see here in pink, MBI. What is MBI? Mantri Basar Incorporated. Mantri Basar Incorporated is controlled directly by the chief minister himself. And he has created a whole network of companies controlled directly by MBI. And as you can see, I've also in, in, in triangles listed the names of uh, politicians who are also sitting as directors of these companies. So if you saw politicians from the Barisan National sitting in the GLC, federal level GLCs having appointments as directors, it was also happening here in uh, Pakatan, in, in, in Selangos, uh, controlled by PKR. And they had representatives from different parties, including, as you can see, from PKR, from DAP, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's one also here from PAS, I may be mistaken. But you can see fair representation of different parties here at the time. Look at, let's go to the next one, Johor. This is Amno, controlled. Amno controlled state. Also, you will see a similar GLC network. Let's go to the next one. PAS, just to let you know, in Klantan, PAS to head created a GLC network. More haphazard, as you can see, more haphazard in terms of how it's controlled, but every state has a GLC network. Now, why is this important for you to know? We have been calling for the reform of this GLC world to bring it out into the light, as I said, let everyone know about it, but nobody wants to talk about it in the political arena. Why is that? Because as you can see, Different parties control their own GLC worlds if they control a particular state government. In 2018, when we had that historic election of the 13 state governments we had, eight different parties, eight different parties controlled, had control of the 13 state governments. And they belonged to either the Parisa National or to the Pakata. Now, if eight different parties had control of their own state governments, which had control of their own GLC world, why reform? Why reform? When we can use the same system you know, at, all, at the state level. So what's happening at the federal level is also happening at the state level. That's how bad the situation is. 
I must say that we wanted to do a study of Sarawak and Sabah, but we haven't been able to do that. This itself took us a long time to do this kind of research. I did go to Sabah after Sabah fell to Warisan. We attended a forum where uh, we even offered to map out the GLC world in Sabah and to bring about reforms in Sabah. Unfortunately, I didn't get the call back and subsequently the Warisan government fell. So I'm not, I'll never be sure whether they plan to call us into reform, to bring about reform of the GLC world in Sabah. But there you are. Here it is, this GLC world. I have now described to you, you can, you can see for yourself what the GLC world looks like. Now you know why this is so important. Now you know why politicians don't want to talk about it. Why you, now you know why it is never in the main frame of discussions because politicians prefer to keep a lid on it because everyone seems to be benefiting from it. it as you can see here, even in PASS, in triangles, you can see the number of people who are associated with PASS who were given GLC appointments. When you get a GLC appointment, you get a stipend. What happens to the money? The money gets channeled into the political system to support your political uh, activities. And this is linked, the GLC world is therefore very closely linked to the issue of political financing, an issue we must also discuss. Now you know why there's a reluctance also to talk about political financing and to bring into, into parliament the Political Financing Act. Now what is the consequence of all this? Where are we today? So let me now take you into the real economy. Let's start with the corporate sector. If you look at the top companies in Malaysia today, I've listed here the top 15 as per 2018. The ones in red are the GLCs. This is just to give you a, uh, a now a breakdown of how powerful these GLCs are. If you look at the top 10, eight of them, top 10, eight of them are GLCs. If you look at the top 20, nearly half of them are GLCs. If you look at the top 50, you can see the number of GLCs here. They are very important. I said at the beginning of this lecture, Mahathir wanted to create Bumiputra capitalists. Where are all the Bumiputra capitalists that are supposed to be the products of the new economic policy, the NET? Where have they all gone? Here, as you can see, we have only two in the top 50. Uh, M Bank, controlled by Asman Hashim, who is, I hear, probably going to sell out very soon. And then we have MMC Corporation, Side Mokta, the well connected Side Mokta. It's an indication of the failure of Mahathir's agenda to create Bumiputra corporate captains. Tangible evidence of this. So this is the breakdown for the big firms. Let me give you another diagram, which is another table, which is very important. I want to take you through this table. This is very important. Let me be clear. This is not my table. This is a table that I took from the shared prosperity vision document. I want to stress this because people, whenever I show this, people say this is Terence Gomez table. This is not my table. I took it to show you, to give you the breakdown of equity distribution, which was supposed to be one of the objects, equitable equity distribution, which is supposed to be one of the key objectives of the new economic policy, NET. If you look at this, what is very significant is that in 1970, when they introduced the uh, NET, the volume of equity owned by Bumiputras was only 2.4%. There was real inequity in terms of distribution of wealth among ethnic groups. The NEP was a good policy. Let me stress that. There was a lot of good in the NEP. And as you can see, by 1990, they had increased during the 20 year period of the NEP. They'd grown from 2.4% to 19.2%. Much of it has been, can be attributed to the role of the GLCs or the public enterprises that acquired corporate equity on behalf of the Bumiputras and held it for them. But look at what's happened since then. And what is very significant is that the high point was 2011. This is according to the SPV document. According to the SPV document in 2011, that was the high point, 23.4%. But between 2011 and 2015, what is shocking is a seven percentage point fall in equity ownership by Bumi Putras. That's too much, too fast. What's going on here? And let me show you, I would like to get the more recent equity distribution because, but I can't get it because it comes from the government. I'm waiting for the 12th Malaysia plan to see whether it will be in the 12th Malaysia plan, whether we can get more updated figures on the equity distribution. Now let's look at the non-Bumiputras. 
non Bumiputra said in 1970, look at the Chinese, 27.2%. By 1990, they reached their high point. 1990 was the high point, 45.5%. We should have stopped the NEP instead of continuing with race-based policies in 1990 because they were doing quite well until then. They were supposed to stop it then, but they continued. And if you look at the figures, it's been falling since then. And look at the most recent figures for non Bumiputra's Chinese and Indians and others combined. The total is 30.7%. What is important here is that the volume of equity owned by non Bumiputras in 2015 is the same as the volume of equity owned by them in 1970. So after more than four decades, according to the government's figures, there's been no improvement. In fact, they've been falling behind very quickly. So Bumiputras are falling behind. Non-Bumiputras are also falling behind. All Malaysians are falling behind. Who is gaining? And now look at the figures for foreigners. In 1970, it was 63, the peak, 63.4%. Uh, then the government intervenes, used the public enterprises to buy out equity mainly from foreign companies. And as you can see, the fall, significant fall. And by 1990, it had fallen to its lowest point, 25.4%. But since then, it has been increasing. But look at the figures for 2015. In between, 20, between 2011 and 2015, there was a seven percentage point, eight percentage point increase in equity by foreigners. Suddenly, foreigners are emerging as major corporate owners of equity in this country, while Malaysians are falling behind, according to these figures. What does it look like now, five years on, six years on? Have foreigners begun to emerge as major shareholders of this economy as they were in 1970? These are important questions that we have to ask ourselves and of the government. So who are these foreigners who are gaining control in this economy? Now, one of the most important things that happened of late was, and I must get to this, the rise of China. When Xi Jinping took over more recently in 2013, he introduced the Belt Road Initiative. And from there, he began to move out into Asia in a big way. And what we saw under Najib, was the opening up of the Malaysian economy in 2013 to investments from China. And here's, an, here's a diagram of uh, some of the investments in 2017 in the run-up to the election in 2018. Now, this is important. 2013, Xi Jinping comes to power. He introduces the BRI. He wants to make greater inroads throughout uh, emerging economies in Southeast Asia and Asia. Malaysia is at the center of it all for the Belt Road Initiative. What is also important in 2013, Najib encountered a disastrous election. He then introduced the Bumiputra economic empowerment policy. Gone was the slogan, One Malaysia. He no longer talked about One Malaysia. It was now BEE, -E, meaning he's going to use the GLCs. And subsequently, what happened? GLCs from Malaysia began to work very closely with state-owned enterprises from China. The best example of this is, of course, ECRL which was also linked to 1MBB. I'm now showing you here a new phenomenon. If before we talked about public-private partnerships, now we are talking about public-public partnerships. GLCs, state-owned enterprises in Malaysia, working with state-owned enterprises, SOEs from China. Two strong men, Najib and Xi Jinping, coming together and dictating investment patterns into this country. And as you can see, uh, the investment flows have been quite huge. And this is just 2017 figures. I brought in the figure for Sarawak. I should let you know the volume of investments from China into Sarawak have been huge. Now, how do you make sense of this? How do you break this down? So I should let you also know, just last year, late last year, we published a book entitled China in Malaysia. It's a slim volume. Please read it if you want to know about China's investments in Malaysia. It's not all state state. It's not all public public. You can see major projects. Yes, they are public public state state. But we also have state private. That means state owned institutions like the GLCs working with private institutions from China. We also have private private. That means privately owned Malaysian firms working with privately owned companies from China. And then we have Chinese only enterprises. They constitute a huge 30%. But the largest in terms of money figures in the contract value are state-state projects. 
how much oversight is there of these investments from China into Malaysia today? I'm raising this as a question. I'm not saying that all Chinese investments are bad. I'm not saying that. But I am also saying that we need to be careful about such investments, especially when it's state state, when there's very little accountability on the part of governments coming together and deciding on their own where to invest in. And we have already seen major projects which are controversial. I only mentioned ECRL, but we have the Malacca Gateway project, for example. We have the Kuantan Port for example, and there's a whole slew of them where there, there was some controversy. Mahate himself went to visit the MCKIP, the Malaysia-China Kuantan uh, uh, Industrial Park in Kuantan. He couldn't gain entry into the MCKIP. It's a huge industrial site. Mahate complained, I am the former prime minister and I can't enter into the MCK, MCKIP uh, project area. You should see the MCKIP project area, it's huge. Eh? I should know because I too went to, to visit MCKIP and I too couldn't get entry. I wasn't feeling so bad later when I found out that Mahate too also couldn't get entry into the MCKIP. What does this indicate? These are important issues, again, that we must ask of ourselves. Who is monitoring these investments? Of late, there have also been an outflow of foreign direct investments. Foreign investors are also leaving the country. That's also important, huh? I should stress that. Who are these foreign investors who are leaving this country? Where does that leave us? And where does this leave the figures that I just showed you in terms of foreign equity ownership? Why are foreign firms leaving us too? Because the state of Malaysia is so is deplorable. The politics of this country is so dire. The public policies that are coming out, where are the public policies? So where does that leave us? So this brings me to Malaysia today. I have now exposed you to this GLC framework. When I started this lecture, I did tell you very clearly that Tunku Zafrul, as soon as the pandemic occurred, drew reference to a government ecosystem. He was talking about this GLC framework that I just showed you, well embedded in the economy and can be used to do good things if they do it in an open and transparent manner. They were created to go and bring about social reforms, help the poor bring about industrialization in rural areas, bring about infrastructure development in rural areas, bring rural industries into the mainstream of the economy. They have taken their eye off the ball because they have used this GLC framework to further enrich themselves, politicians, they, I mean, politicians in power. The prime minister has enormous control over this GLC world. We saw it under Najib, we saw it under Mahate, we saw it under Muhyiddin, what is it going to be like under Ismail Sabri? Ismail Sabri, as I told you, is a Najib protege. He knows this GLC world very well. I showed you, he was Minister of Rural Development. He knows how the whole system works. And he has appointed a fellow Amno person in charge of Ministry of Rural Development. Why? Rural areas, gerrymandering, the ballot apportionment, and with a general election coming up, it's very important to control the rural constituencies. Will it still remain patronage based? Yes. Mohidin showed us that. As soon as he could, to ensure that he could consolidate power, he just distributed GLC appointments to politicians. It's a political tool. When it should be used as an economic tool to save Malaysia, it's being used as a political tool to consolidate power. That's the tragedy that we are confronted with today. We have the tools to help revive this economy, to keep it afloat but they are not using that institutional architecture which is in place properly. What are the current, the, the pre-pandemic pre problems? I already mentioned them, the middle income trap. We were talking about growing wealth and income disparities. We were also talking about growing wealth and income inequalities among Bumi Putras themselves. The wealth and income disparities between among Bumi Putras was not very high in 1970. It is now stupendous under uh, and in the current circumstances. There was also enormous discussions about ethnic and gender discrimination, issues that we need to stop, and what of environmental degradation. The volume of environmental degradation in this country is also a, a serious problem. We were talking about all these issues. We were also talking at the time about the SMEs, the corporate sector. As I said earlier, we have 1.2 million companies in this country but 98.5% of them are SMEs. 
and 80% of these SMEs are micro firms. What are micro firms? Firms with only about five employees. That's a major structural problem. And these were problems before the pandemic. Most of our companies are micro firms. Today, we are being told by the SME Association that to prepare for this, at least 50% of our SMEs are going to close. They're going to go bankrupt. We're talking about 500,000 companies. They're going to go bankrupt. That's going to mean an escalation in unemployment. It's going to mean an escalation in non-performing loans. The banking sector is going to come under serious crisis. Be prepared. That's what's in store for us. As far back as the 2008 global financial crisis, we were talking about a new economic model. What we're confronted with today is not new. Since 2008, I would go back even further after the 1997 crisis, we were already talking about the need to have a new model. By 2008, when we were in a great recession, Najib comes to power and he says, we need a new model. We all agreed. He introduced a new model which had nothing new in it. It was so clearly manifested and people didn't vote for him in 2013. What's new in your new model? You backtrack so significantly after introducing some new reform ideas. When, Mo when Mahate came to power, he introduced the shared prosperity vision. They promised us no more race-based policies. We will be really far more inclusive. And they come up with the SPV. That was, that was a plan that was created by Mohidin's think tank called MASA. Then Mohidin breaks away, the Sheraton move, he becomes prime minister and he says, SPV is going to be my vision. He says, I am going to have a race-based vision. Let's be frank. He said it. He had a race-based vision. And if you look at the budget last year, we were expecting a major budget. For the first time in about 100 years, we were confronted with a global pandemic of enormous proportions, which had devastated the Malaysian economy. There we were waiting with bated breath for the budget, the 2021 budget. We were expecting an extraordinary budget. And what did we get? A budget which most analysts called an election budget, something for everyone, nothing extraordinary. They were already thinking they're going to have an election anyway. So election budget. And a lot of support targeted at Bumiputra SMEs. And when queried about this, the finance minister himself admitted publicly 80% of our SMEs are Chinese and not Bumi owned. His words, not mine. And you still want to have this kind of targeted, ethnicized uh, policies to help enterprises. And you're only supporting the 20% when the economy is in dire straits. What about the 80%? That's public policy planning under Paikatan. What's going to be new today? Now, as I said, just before the government fell, the Pekatan government fell last month, Tunku Zafrul, as finance minister, said, okay, we are really now in bad shape. We are in real bad shape. So what are you going to do? He introduced what is known as the Pakuko plan. What is this Pakuko plan? Go and read it. It's very interesting because he's again admitting the government ecosystem has to be brought back into the mainframe. He's going to restructure the GLICs. Read it. It's very important. You should know about this. The GLICs are very important. And I'm going to use this architecture, this GLC, GLIC architecture to crowd in SMEs. He admitted that 98% of the corporate sector SMEs, they are in dire straits, we must bring them in. The government must use the GLC system to help SMEs. Otherwise we're all dead in the water. A good admission. He then also announced, or the government announced a digital economy blueprint. Very important. When the pandemic occurred, we were forced to go digital very quickly. We were moving along. We were very reluctant. In universities, they were talking about it. They'll do it once uh, for one, one week in a term, in a semester, and that's about it. Uh, in the corporate sector, very few firms were really into it. S SMEs were not doing it. Suddenly, we all had to do it. We had no choice. And then a big discussion started about the future of work, the concept of future of work. The way we work is changing. The rise of the gig economy. No longer are people interested in going and working for companies. They want to set up their own enterprises, to work for themselves. And then there was talk about e-marketing, e-learning. The digital economy blueprint is very important. So two important things came up, but both of them 
before we could have a proper discussion about them, the government fell. At least there was some attempt to talk about these things, but I must tell you, I read both the Pakuko plan and the digital economy blueprint. It's basically still in the realm of ideas. In terms of actual implementation, how are they going to do it? They were really short on ideas there. So this brings me now to my last slide. Please bear with me. I want to come to today. Where are we today? Just last week, as you know, the uh, Ismail Sabri's government, along with uh, Pakatan, signed an MOU. We were told this is an historic event. The coming together of government and opposition for the first time in Malaysian history. They're going to work together to help lift the Malaysian economy, help Malaysian people deal with this dual crisis that we are now confronted with. How true is this? Is there value in it? Ismail Sabri also talked about his new concept, Kloaga Malaysia. When he said Kloaga Malaysia, I was thinking about his mentor, Najib Razak, talking about One Malaysia. Kloaga Malaysia and Malaysia's, uh, One Malaysia seem very similar in rhetoric. But what is the reality? Are we going to see a real new kind of governance? which is truly inclusive. And if you talk about Kloaga Malaysia, will you also still continue to bypass SMEs based on ethnicity, including during a time of crisis? This is something to watch out for. In the MOU that was signed, they talked about a National Recovery Council. Very good. Actually, if you read the MOU, there are a lot of very good things there. Uh, many, many reforms that we, in activists have been talking about for a long time is there. And one of the things they talked about was the National Recovery Council. They said 50% of it should constitute non-politicians from both the public and private sector. It must be a bit more technocratic, bring in real experts. The remaining 50% will be divided between uh, opposition and government parties. And they will be accountable. There will be regular meetings and they will be accountable also to parliament. Uh, why parliament? Because among the major reforms are parliamentary reforms. We know now parliament is institutionally dysfunctional. We saw that over the past year, completely dysfunctional. So the parliamentary reforms that they are proposing are much needed, including the Parliamentary Services Act, which was introduced in 1963 and then taken away in 1992 by Mahathir. That brought into question the separation of powers between the executive legislature and the legislature, of course, the judiciary too. And matters pertaining to the legislature were brought under the prime minister's department. How can matters under the legislature be brought under the prime minister's department? That was the practice. So the parliamentary reforms that they are proposing are also very good. The prime minister will have a term limit, two terms or maximum 10 years. Again, very good. The UNDI 18 will be implemented immediately. Again, very good. And the anti-hopping law. That is something we really need. But as much as I looked at these and I, was, I thought these are very reasonable things, I was also drawn to what was not included. Why was there no reference to the GLC world, which everyone, after all, the finance minister had openly admitted, it's a very important world. We have to use this ecosystem now to save the economy. Why no discussion about it? Because as I told you all earlier, politicians, regardless whether they're in opposition or in government, their parties have control of state governments. They also control a GLC world. And nobody wants to give up their control of the GLC world. What happened to the financing of politics, which is closely linked to the GLC world? Again, no discussion on political financing reform. And yet we know if you want to have clean and fair election, you've got to do something about political financing. And why then also no discussion about creating a truly independent election commission? So there are many things missing, which will suggest that if we do have an election, I can't see it as going to be a real free and fair election because these crucial things are not dealt with. So we, the Rakyat, should put a lot of... Uh, send out a lot of uh, statements to, to our politicians. What about these things? Can you please include them also in the reforms that you're talking about? But there are other upcoming matters, urgent matters I would like you all to focus on. 
I talked about the shared prosperity vision. It was a Mohidin construct, first under Pakatan, then under Pekatan. Mohidin is now out. Amno has returned. Ismail Sabri has taken over. Will they still support the shared prosperity vision? Will Amno support a Basatu, a Basatu vision? I don't think so. So watch, watch for the long-term plan, of what's going to happen here. What is coming up at the end of this month is the 12th Malaysia plan. Now that we have to watch very carefully. It's a five-year plan. What is this government proposing for us in the next five years? And how is this linked to the digital blueprint? We can't run away from the digitalization of the economy. It's happening so rapidly, we've got to do something about it. Will there be a coherent link between GLCs and SMEs? Will there be a link between the economy, education, rural development, food security, infrastructure, where all these GLCs are present? Will we see these kind of reforms? I don't see it happening. But at the same time, I remember that the new finance minister is the old finance minister, the Guzafro. So will he try to keep to that agenda of instituting these two things that he's been talking about? And finally, next month, we will have the budget. Will this be an extraordinary budget? Because it's a budget which will be created by the government in consultation with the opposition as per the agreement in the MOU. So if opposition and government are working together in discussion in discussing the budget, will we see a truly different kind of budget? Watch for it. If you watch the budget and if you see the outcomes, you will know how effective is this cooperation between the opposition and the government. So let me end there, here. I've basically now given you all a rundown of Malaysian history rather quickly, and I've exposed you to the GLC world to show you how central it is to our Malaysian political economy context. There's a lot for us to think about, and there's a lot for us to try and learn more about if we are to truly understand the structure of Malaysia's political economy and how it shapes our political system. Thank you.